Psalm 40, and it's on page 468 in the Pew Bibles, and I will be reading from the ESV this morning. Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than, I, than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. You may be seated. I am entering the stage in parenting where I am getting to teach my children games that I love. And the growing up, I played, uh, my brother and I played baseball. We're big baseball people. Um, we're counting down to opening day. Opening day is coming up. We love baseball in our family. And so I have recently enjoyed taking Everly in the backyard and tossing a ball and, and you know, she's working on her swing. And, and right now, with Everly, my instructions are very simple. They're very simple. I say to her, here's the ball, and I make sure her stance is right, because with a baseball stance, you've got to make sure you're not in your own way. You've got to make sure you're not inhibiting movement. You just want something simple so the bat can go straight through the strike zone. And I'm helping her think about the basics. In my instructions, I hold the ball up and I'll say, watch the ball out of my hand the whole time. Don't watch anything else. Watch the ball out of my hand the whole time. Don't watch anything else. And she does this, she does this thing where she gets up, especially if the sun's out, and she looks at her shadow to make sure her stance is good. I don't know why she's looking at her shadow, but she's looking at her shadow. Maybe she's making sure, maybe she's seeing if she looks good, right? Do I look cool right now? And then the other thing she does, especially, and, and if you're a parent, you'll get this, especially if mommy is in the backyard, she's watching to see if mommy's watching. Because when she cranks that thing, man, we need to make sure we got an audience. Which is why I say to her, don't focus on anything else. Watch the ball out of my hand the whole time. 
This morning, I'm going to encourage you from 1 Samuel 15 to watch the ball out of my hand. Don't look at anything else. Because this text is going to bring us right back to the mo- perhaps the most basic thing of what it means to be a follower of God. The most basic thing of what it means to be a follower of God. And sometimes we get in our own way. And sometimes we pay attention to see if other people are watching. And sometimes we, we get caught looking at our own shadow. We, we get caught analyzing too much. And we miss the ball. We miss the basic. Something that Saul himself has been doing. He's just looking at the wrong thing. And he's swung and missed a few times. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're going through 1 Samuel. We are, we're really just working through kind of the sad story of Saul over the last few chapters. He's a guy you want to root for. I mean, you pull in for him a little bit. He, he, he's the first king. He's the guy that Israel wanted. He's the man. He's the, he, he, he seems like he should be bringing hope and victory. And, and he does. He brings some victory here and there. But you notice it's, it's not really him. And actually, we're right at the end of his story today because, well, we'll deal with him in the next few chapters, but we're introducing the end of his story today because the foreshadowing of the immediate king to follow him is going to take place in today's text. And we see the reason ultimately that he struck out is just because he didn't keep in mind the basics. If I were to ask you, what do you think the most basic thing for being a Christian, for being a follower of God? What's the most basic thing? What does God expect of you more than anything? It wouldn't change whether it was Saul or whether it was you or it was me. God wants us to obey him. Would you pray with me? We'll get started. Father, we are thankful this morning for your word. I pray that from this passage... And in this time, you would make us obedient Christians. You'd make us obedient people. People who do what you say for the right reasons. And I ask these things through Jesus. Amen. Start reading with me in verse 9. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child, infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim. 2,000 men of foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said, Go to the Kenites, go, said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Malachites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people, to the people of Israel, when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the ox and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Verses 1 through 9, I, I think that we see a failure to obey orders a failure to obey orders. Let's just work through some of the details of this passage. Uh, we have another enemy introduced. Up until this point, we've had the Ammonites and we've had the Philistines, and now an enemy of Israel is introduced, the Amalekites. The Amalekites were essentially a, a, traveling, a traveling tribe of raiders. They were nomadic raiders, and the, they inhabited the, the southern deserts of Judah. 
and they're, they're kind of plunderers. They, they were first introduced to them, which is the, the, the illusion, the, the uh, reference in the passage, what they did when the people were coming out of Egypt. We find this in Exodus 17 and verse 8. They attacked Israel at Rephidim, and the Lord declared war on them in Exodus 17. And again, we can, you can find that account in Deuteronomy 17 as well. Uh, in Numbers 14 and in Judges 3, they, they join other armies in attacking Israel. So they have, a, they have a tendency to go up against Israel. They have a habit of attacking Israel. We'll see them again. David will fight against them in uh, chapter 30 and then in 2 Samuel chapter 8. So we're introduced to who these guys are. They're, uh, they're a traveling, nomadic uh, army of raiders, a pretty substantial civilization. Verses 1 through 3, we see the order is what? The order is that you need to go and you need to conquer them and, and you need to kill everybody. And uh, some people have concern with passages like this, and I did want to briefly mention the, the concern that sometimes the reaction sometimes we get with passages like this. Um, when it says, verse 2, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel, how they came up out of, when they opposed them, when they came up out of Egypt, verse 3, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them. And it says, wipe out everybody. And there are several ways to look at passages like this. Um, American people with a little more sensitivity and a little less of a appetite for war and brutality than, than these writers did when it was written and in this society and in this culture in which the scriptures were written. Uh, we don't have the same um, understanding and we don't have the same appetite. Uh, we are a little more sensitive. And so one of the ways that, that we need to approach the Bible is we need to make sure that we read it the way that they read it and the way that they understood it. This wouldn't have affected them like it does us. It kind of bothers us. But it didn't bother them. It was a different time. It was a different world. And so when we think about the world of the Bible, we need to make sure that we're appropriately applying that world to our world and making sure that truth and that theology speaks to us. There is something significant here, though. When he says to devote to destruction, essentially what he's saying is this is a sacrifice to the Lord. The Lord deserves this. God deserves this victory because of these people, because of the Amalekites' opposition to them. Some people are going to look at passages like this, and I think that there are times when this is appropriate, and I think there are times that we see this in the Scriptures, where the author, the writer, is using intentionally exaggerated military language because that's how uh, they would have understood it in this culture. Perhaps um, when you and I watch a sports game and someone really gets dominated, what do we say? We'll say, oh, they got clocked or someone took their lunch, right? Or we use phrases like that. They cleaned them out. They got smoked. We are hyperbolizing that victory. We're using intentionally exaggerated language to point out that victory. There are times in the scriptures I think the writer is doing that. I don't think that's what's going on here, though. Everyone's supposed to get wiped out. And the reason we know this is because the exact disobedience that Saul accomplished is that he didn't wipe everybody out. So this is a failure to obey orders. He doesn't do this. It's pragmatic. And we've seen this with Saul before. He has this kind of air of pragmatism where he does what partially spiritually makes sense and partially humanly makes sense. And he tries to find a way to work both out of human sensibility and, and accommodate it with his devotion to God. He approaches the will of God with an aspect of making it work for both God and for him. Just think back on his history, and if you're visiting with us this morning, I'll recount Saul just a little bit for you now. He impulsively and conveniently sacrifices to the Lord back in chapter 13. The battle's going poorly, so he offers up a sacrifice hoping that God will essentially be pleased with him and, and, and this pleasure would result in a, in a victory. And so he does a spiritual task for a pragmatic purpose. 
He joins the battle in chapter 14 after the battle is already going well. And he asks that the Ark of the Covenant be brought in in chapter 14 essentially as a good luck charm or a token, hoping that it will bring them victory. He has a history of pragmatic, partial accomplishment of God's will. Here we see essentially he did it for economic purposes. He, didn't, he, he took all the good cows and he took all the good sheep. Why? Because they'll benefit, you know, food and livestock and it'll be a good thing for the nation and for the kingdom and you can justify it all the ways you want humanly. But what did God say? The specific instruction was even infant, or was even ox and sheep and camel and donkey. And what does it say that he kept? The fattened calves and all that was good and the lambs and everything else that he didn't think was of good quality. Verse 9 he committed to destruction. Loved one, just a reminder this morning, there's no such thing as partial obedience. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. How often do you and I do what we do for gain rather than for God's glory? It's a good practice We're obeying something that God has given or God has said, but it may even be for pragmatic purposes. We accommodate the will of God and the commands of God with our own will and our own desires. Saul disobeys, and the reasons are not justifiable, for there are no justifiable reasons to disobey. And again, I ask, how often do we do, or do you attempt to do, what both, what both brings you gain and allows you to satisfy, well, I served God, didn't I? I obeyed God, didn't I? Saul fulfills, in the past, and you'll see it, we'll see it in this text, he fulfills a spiritual task for personal purposes. Do you serve in church for a pat on the back? Do you give in the offering plate so that God would raise your salary? Discipline your parents so that you'd be lauded. Discipline your kids so that you'd be lauded as good parents. Don't discipline your parents. You discipline your children so that you'll gain respect as good parents. Do you attend church to receive favor from God rather than contributing to the congregation? Do you just want to obey God because it's the right thing to do and you desire more of Him, or do you obey God because you want something He can give you? God, forgive our false motives. Rather than consoling ourselves with partial obedience, we should confess for complete disobedience. So, Saul disobeys. We've already heard from Samuel once in the text, and I just want you to note in verse, uh, verse 1 and 2, or verse 1, that the whole passage is oriented to whether or not Saul is going to obey. What's he say? What's Samuel say? Listen to the words of the Lord. We should have in mind concepts of submission and obedience from the outset. It frames the whole text. Listen to the word of the Lord. Verse 10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has not turned back, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told to Samuel, Saul, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned, he passed on and went down to Gilgal. So this event leads to some, what I'm, fall, what I'm calling in the passage, some conflicting feelings, some conflicting feelings. This event of Saul's disobedience to God for pragmatic purposes leads to some conflicting feelings, and And we'll see three 
kind of responses to this disobedience throughout the text. And the first one I want you to see in verses 10 and 11 is God's reaction or God's emotional consideration of the text. Reaction is not a good term, but his emotional consideration within the passage. And it's grief. So the first thing I want you to see in verses 10 and 11 is God's grief. He regretted that he, has, he made Saul king. Now, this is a, an interesting concept, and I want to help you understand it a little bit, because if you have a good theology of God, you'll know that he's sovereign, and he's not reactive. Sometimes when we think of God's sovereignty, you might try to accommodate God's sovereignty by saying, oh, but he's also, he, he, he knows everything. His, his foreknowledge helps us understand his sovereignty. Since he knows everything, he knows what he's going to do and all of those kind of things. And I want you to understand that God's foreknowledge is actually, is actually secondary to his sovereignty, okay? He, he does what he's going to do and he knows all things, This allows us to understand that God is not a reactive God. He is a proactively sovereign God. You say, well, what does this mean that he regrets? Why did he do it then? Well, you know from a textual reason why he did it, and you know the textual reason from a few chapters ago, remember? He says when he sets up Saul as king in chapters 9 and 10, I will give you a king like the other nations. It's what you asked for. So the human, pragmatic, textual reason, the the biblical reason that he gives them the king, that he gives them Saul, is because it's what they asked for. It's what you wanted. This kind of regret is not the same way that you and I tend to understand regret. Because we're going to see later in the passage that Samuel says that God doesn't change his mind, he doesn't lie. So it can't be this kind of regret that, oh, I wish I would have done something different on the front side. Because God never regrets His will. God always does it right the first time. So this regret should be better understood as an idea of grief. We'll see it again in verse 11 and again in verse 35. That it grieves Him. Don't think of this as decisional regret, like he's made a mistake and he wished he wouldn't have done it. This doesn't mean regret like, oh man, I regret my breakfast because it was unhealthy. I had a donut when I should have had something else. Maybe you don't regret the donut. Maybe it was a great decision. It's not that kind of regret. This is a consequential grief. A consequential grief. The outcome of this circumstance grieved his heart. God has always always intended this. To give him a king like the other nations, fully knowing it would have grievous consequences. Remember how he warns them in chapter 8. Maybe I can help you understand this with an illustration that happened recently in our home. By a set of circumstances, one of my children's car seats recently has been moved to the back seat just for convenience and practical purposes. And So one of my children's car seats is in the back seat. Well, recently, mommy and the, the kids and a friend went to get coffee and some, some pastries. And some of those pastries ended up in the back. Now, those pastries were bought and intended for daddy. Because daddy could not go for coffee and pastries. And this child was very transparent and was very repentant. But upon arriving home, informed mother that the desserts were eaten. (laughs) Now listen, nobody in that situation said, Man, I really wish we hadn't have bought these sweets. In other words, no one regretted the initiating decision to buy the desserts. It was the consequence of that decision that kind of bummed Daddy out. (laughs) It was Daddy's dessert. But no one said, oh, the original decision was the wrong decision. And so it's that kind of concept that we should understand here. The consequences of this decision caused God's grief, 
but we shouldn't attribute the grievous consequences to the initiating decision. Isaiah says in chapter 46, Remember the former things, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. God is not reactive. He is absolutely sovereign. And I think this is an appropriate place, an important place, to remind ourselves that God in the immensity and perfection and balance of his nature, has a category for grief. And he's willing to accept yours. There's another response in the text. Samuel's. Look with me at verse 11. Or verse 12. Or yeah, verse 11, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. So you note Samuel's anger. You say, what's he angry about? Presumably for the same reason, the the disappointment, the letdown that's coming from Saul's reign. This was supposed to go well. It's not going well. I'll also point out that some commentators think, it's, it's vague, so I don't want to read too much into it, but some commentators think that, Saul's, or that Samuel is actually angry here about the tension that we just discussed, that Samuel might actually be struggling with the concept that God made Saul king, and now the consequences are difficult. Which again, just goes back to the previous app, if that's the situation, goes back to the previous application we just mentioned, God is a category for our grief and he receives ours. God is a category for grief himself and he receives ours. I tend to think the most logical, natural reading is that he's angry about the situation with Saul and he's not particularly happy with Saul himself. You've you've probably felt the frustration of Someone just not learning from their stupidity. Like, what are we doing here, Saul? Time and time again, you're messing this up. Why haven't you learned yet? And I tend to think that's probably what's going on in Saul's, or Samuel's situation. He takes these complaints and these struggles that he's having with the situation to God himself. I do think that's important to know. It's a small line, but where does he say, where does, it, where does he cry to the Lord? He cried to the Lord all night. And I, again, I don't want to press this beyond what I think is here, but this is certainly here. In the deepest pains and confusion and angers of your heart, make sure you take them to the right place. I shared this with uh, our Wednesday night crowd a few weeks ago as we were going through the Psalms. And I, and, and I think Job is such a good illustration of this, the whole telling of Job. You get to the end of Job, what does God say when he's rebuking Job's bad friends? This is in chapter 41, I believe. He says, Job, my servant, has honored me. A question. If you've read from like Job 4 on, does Job sound like, sound like he's honoring God all the time? No, he doesn't. He's pretty mad at God sometimes. He says some crazy things. He says some things that we would think are disrespectful. So how can it make sense that God would say, my Job, my servant has honored me? It didn't sound like he was honoring you. And I think one of the explanations for that is that even in his anger and even when his lament took a tone that you and, I think, you, wouldn't, you and I wouldn't think is very honorable. He lamented to the right person. And he took it to the right place. God, even in the passion of our prayers, and when we show our humanity and struggle, is pleased to hear our prayers. So when you struggle... Struggle with and through the Lord. The situation causes some anger in Samuel, and understandably so. So what's Saul's response in all of this? What's Saul's response in all of this? 
I want you to see that God was grieved, Samuel was angry, and Saul's response is self-justification. Saul is feeling a little bit self-justified in all of this. Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Wait a second. Have you? And then and Samuel said, verse 14, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? It's a, very, it's a very roundabout way to say, I don't think you have. Because you were supposed to kill the animals, and I'm, I'm hearing some sheep. Verse 15, Saul said, they have, brought, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spare the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. What's he say? You know, we have this problem with these people. I know, we're supposed to, I know we're supposed to get rid of all the animals, but these people have a problem. They started taking some sheep, and they started saving the best of the oxen, but everybody else, we did what God said. Now, we've seen Saul play the blame game before, haven't we? Do you remember back when he offered the sacrifice hastily in chapter 13? What's the first thing he said to Samuel? Because you weren't here yet. And because I saw the people running away from me. Right back to this tendency when we disobey to find a justifiable reason or someone else to take the fault. Which we've also seen in Saul last week when Jonathan was the subject, the consequence of the hasty vow, and he was willing to put Jonathan to death for it. Saul just believes that everyone else should take the fall for his issues of disobedience. And loved one, that sounds really mean and really harsh and really terrible of Saul. But when you're caught in sin, and when you know you're wrong, How many times and how many ways do you find why it was okay or it was justifiable or it made sense or if someone just understood? This is in all of us. Disobedience and self-justification are usually found together and they are really bad friends. His shifting of fault came from a low view of God's command of His Word and a low view of others. In your marriage, how quick are you to repent? When your children fail, how quick are you to point out their sin but not your sinful reaction to their failure. We can always find really good reasons for why what we did was okay. But if God has commanded against it, there is no justifiable reason. Loved one, the greatest antidote to self-justification is a right view of grace. You know what grace says? Grace says that it is actually okay to be broken because Christ will forgive it and Christ will sanctify us. He'll make it right. And Samuel's had enough of the self justification. He's like, I'm just not. We're not doing this anymore. Look at me at verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop! <laughs> All right, be quiet. We're not doing this anymore. I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. It's like, oh, Samuel knows. Saul said, speak. Verse 17 is so fascinating. Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? Essentially, what is being said here is you have acted as though you are little, and probably what he's immediately referring to is the blame game that he's saying, you're treating others like they're little, which is essentially meaning that you're acting like 
you're little. You're taking who God has made you and seeing it with a small perspective. And he went wrong. He failed in the most, the most central command, the most blessed basic, the thing that God said you have to do before you do anything else. Back when he gave them a king in chapter 9, you must obey my word. And this is where Saul failed. Verses 17 and following is essentially Samuel just saying, I know what you did. You were told to do this, and this isn't what you did. Verse 19, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? You were supposed to obey. And Saul makes excuses again. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought back Agag, the king of the Amalek, and devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, the sheep and the ox, and the best of things devoted for destruction. He's doing the same thing. He just starts to spout these excuses. and, And Saul, not distracted, brings it back to the central focus, the main perspective. You can make all the excuses, but here's what you didn't do. And in verses 22 and 23, we see the central focus. Obedience. You didn't obey the Lord. Verse 22, and Samuel said, and now the structure changes because it's almost given as like a poetic, a a, a prophetic message. Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen is better than the fat of rams, or the the sacrifice of the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and the presumption as the iniquity of idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. You disobeyed. He has rejected you from being king. God desires real obedience over religious obligation. To obey is better than sacrifice. Samuel is getting exactly to the heart of Saul's problem. You can't do a spiritual thing or a thing that you think is godly for pragmatic reasons. You can't just make a godly, you can't make a vow, an oath. You can't just do the sacrifice. You can't obey the way that you think is right and keep back the animals. To obey is better than then sacrifice. God is after sincerity. David understands this in his confession in Psalm 51, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. God is more concerned with our being than he is firstly with our doing. Because what we do is a result of who we are. The problem is, sometimes we try to hide the deficiencies of our heart with godly activity. Did you hear what I said? We try to hide the deficiencies of our heart by just doing what Christians do. In the South, we have a phrase, you can put lipstick on a pig, but that don't make it pretty. Jesus uses similar terminology. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all kinds of uncleanness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The Pharisees, the New Testament bad guys, were so obsessed with law-keeping that they literally added more law to keep. And inside every single one of us, there's an inclination towards earning something, to earn favor, money, attention, success. And we may want it so badly, we will hide the death in our heart by attempting to look like there's life 
on the outside. We cannot hide who we are from God. It is possible that there's even one here who's looked like a Christian for so long they've convinced everyone else and maybe even themselves that they are one. Loved one, can I, just, can I just remind you of the joy of what it means to live sincerely before God? For God's Spirit, the Spirit of life, Romans 8, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Living according to the law with no sincerity causes guilt and discouragement and fear. But to live obediently to God because the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death and death brings joy and fulfillment and hope and security. So this morning, I'm going to cut it short. We're going to return to this next week. But this morning, I want to remind you of something. Because it is so easy as a Christian. It's so tempting as a Christian. When someone says to you, the word is open, the preacher stands before you, the Sunday school teacher stands before you, you're in a discipleship time or you're receiving accountability from someone, it is so tempting to put on and give the right answers and talk about what you know and try to appear godly. But when someone comes, stands before you or sits before you and says, here's the ball, obey. Don't look at anything else. Don't look at what other people are looking at. Oh, is someone watching? Is someone going to think that I'm a good Christian? Is someone going to think I'm, I'm really hitting home runs every week? Is someone going to think my, my family is awesome? Don't look for the audience. Unless the audience is God. And don't look at yourself. Unless it be with confession and sincerity. Look at the ball. Which is to obey. Truly, like the little song we learned when we were a little kid. Obedience is the very best way. Obedience is the very best way. So what is God asking of you today? Do you need to stop clicking on those websites? Do you need to love your spouse more sacrificially? Do you need to give your anger and your bitterness over to the Lord? What is God requiring of you today? Obedience is the very best way. Would you pray with me?